welcome to the show, this the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. What is up, you guys? We're hitting you up with the recap of UFC Vegas 67, the first UFC event of 2023. Unfortunately for me, it was not a productive card as far as betting goes. We go 0 for 3, and that's dating back to the last event of 2022, where you guys know I didn't have a great outing there either. So obviously, that's back-to-back events that I that I am not performing the way that I want to perform. I'm not happy about that. Uh, fortunately enough, uh, you know, overall 2022 was very productive, but as far as the last two events go, not happy with the work that, that we're putting in over here or, or the productivity that we're getting. And I'm going to clean that up, expecting a major card coming up this upcoming weekend. You guys know when we have a couple little hiccups or little bumps in the road, we always bounce back big and that's what's about to happen. But as you guys know, we're always transparent here and uh, it was not a good event for me. We go 0 for 3. We'll be getting to those three official plays here as we break down the card. We'll be doing some matchmaking for all the winners throughout this card. And um, we're going to be talking about uh, Charles Johnson and Jimmy Flick to kick things off. Charles Johnson, I thought that this was his coming out party. Um, I mean, he looked really, really good here. Uh, I know that Jimmy Flick was coming off a little bit of a layoff, obviously, with flirting with retirement and whatnot, but he looked to be in good shape and uh, looked like he, he's fully committed back to the game and could have been a little bit of ring rust or whatnot. But at the end of the day, Charles Johnson just looked really, really good, uh, was raining some nasty ground and pound. And um, remember now, Charles Johnson is a fighter that was respected coming into the UFC. He was respected on the regional scene, comes in, faces a guy like Muhammad Makayoff in his UFC debut. That's a tough fight. People believe that he... he Performed pretty decent in that fight. I mean, if you look at the betting line and how that fight played out, it played out a little bit closer um, than the, the the rest of Mikhail's fights. So we understand that Charles Johnson's a good fighter. Um, and I, I mean, we have a great opponent uh, for, for Charles Johnson to face off within his next fight, in my opinion. And it was a fighter that we had the pleasure of watching perform this past weekend as well. We take a look at the flyweight uh, tapology worldwide rankings we're going to scroll down to 21 where charles johnson energy is currently ranked and you're going to see that right above him is alan nashamento which obviously we're going to be talking about him in a second he had a big time victory on this uh, this card as well showing again that he's a nasty uh a, a nasty submission uh submission player i mean he could really go out there and pull the sub off pulled off a beautiful choke we'll talk about him but i think this is a great fight uh both guys obviously fighting on the same date um you know, Charles Johnson has mentioned that he wants to be more active. I want to see Alan Nascimento more active. He's only averaging, uh, you know, roughly a fight a year at this point, maybe a little bit more so. But he he's not being as active as I think he should. I think that Alan Nascimento is a fighter that really has a lot of promise. I think that the winner of the, of that fight would really start to get some traction. I mean, if you don't want to go that route and you kind of want them to go down their own paths, I, I can understand some people going down that route a little bit. But that's the fight that I want to see. I think that's just a it's a big time fight. And the flyweight division and then the winner instantly starts to, to to make some noise there. That's the fight that I want to see. What do you guys think about that? All right. So uh, that was that was the first fight of the card. Big time victory for Charles Johnson. And obviously Charles Johnson was a he was a favorite going into that fight. Everybody was really on Charles. Obviously, I picked them all. You guys were I'm sure were on Charles as well. We respect Jimmy Flick's submission game, but the layoff and all that, it was a little hard to pick him there. Although he is a dangerous fighter, and I wasn't really crazy about the betting line uh, as far as how high it was on Charles. And one other thing to note, after the fight, Jimmy Flick did mention that he will be back. And, and I really do believe that. I think that he'll go back. And this was obviously uh, a return to the cage after a layoff. I think he'll be a little bit more ready to go in his next fight. All right. So in the next match in the featherweight division, Dan Argueta takes out Nick Aguare. Uh, Nick, Nick Aguare uh, making his UFC debut, taking the, the fight on short notice. Dan Argueta. Uh, you know, obviously from the Ultimate Fighter show, Dan Argueta. This guy's a beast, man. Uh, I really do believe that that Argueta is a beast. Um, you know, coming in with the shaved head. I mean, this guy is just uh, uh, he, he's just relentless, relentless with the grappling, the ground and pound, good cardio. Uh, I really think that he can give a lot of fighters in the UFC problems, especially stylistically. And uh, so, obviously, he gets the unanimous decision, thirty to twenty-seven on all three judges' scorecards. And uh, Dan Argueta. Uh, so just to put things into perspective, he, he did lose his UFC debut against Damon Jackson, who also fought in this card. Um, you know, Jackson was was the much larger fighter there, and 
and Argueta did take that fight on short notice, but this was a great bounce back uh, victory for him, and we'll see how far he can push it. Um, so uh, let's take a look at where he's ranked right now. Uh, he's ranked 77th. Obviously, he's a little bit down. I mean, only having one victory in the UFC, he needs to prove himself a little bit more. But this is a fighter that I definitely think we could see uh, start start to jump up these rankings relatively fast. Okay, so. Uh, you see him there. Uh, I mean, we're going to be taking a look at some of these fighters that are ranked above him. Some of these fighters not even in the UFC. Um, you know, William Gomez uh, just had that, that very entertaining fight uh, towards the end of last year. Um, you know, he, that was his UFC debut. Um, he's ranked 73rd. Um, I would like to see William Gomez uh, stay active in the UFC. I, th I thought that he's a, a very intriguing fighter. Uh more of a, a striking base fighter. So you got a little bit of a stylistic clash there. I think that that's a fight that would be fun. Makes a lot of sense. If you don't want to go that route, another fight that does stand out to me it is the Steve Garcia fight, which is Steve Garcia coming off that big victory over Chase Hooper. And um, I'm going to lean actually more so towards the Steve Garcia fight, but I, but I do like that William Gomez fight if that's a fight they want to do. But Steve Garcia, he's a tough dude. I, I would kind of like to see the toughness of Garcia and the toughness of Argueta clashing. And they're a little bit different stylistically too. I would really like to see what gives in that fight. Give me give me the Steve uh, Mean Machine Garcia match. I think that that actually is a little bit more intriguing to me. What do you guys think? Which one do you like better? Or, or is there another opponent that you could think of that, that you would like to see Argueta face more so? You got Francis Marshall up here around this range who just had a big victory in his UFC debut coming off Dana White's Contender Series. It's another uh, possibility. I could see a fight with TJ Brown down the line uh, re, uh, coming in the near future. There's a, cu a couple guys you could say that Argueta uh, could, could face off with there. So uh, I'm thinking one of those guys. What do you guys think about that? All right. And Alan Nascimento pulled off a beautiful rear naked choke victory over Carlos Hernandez. Um, another big favorite uh, on this card. Uh, and again, we were all on Argueta. We were all on Johnson. We were all on Alan Nascimento. You guys know where we're going in the next fight as well. Uh, but but Alan Nascimento, a big favorite, but he went out there and he delivered and he performed like he should have. And he's a nasty uh, he, he's a nasty BJJ player. He has some good sub skills. His striking's underrated as well. He's a dangerous fighter. He's 20 and 6. I mean, he, he's really seasoned. And um, again, I think that the fight with him and Charles Johnson makes a lot of sense. I would love to see that fight. That's a fight that I would uh, be excited for. So I wouldn't want to miss that. And that's the fight I want to see there. All right, then we had Mateus Rebecki taking out Nick Fiore, who was 6-0, making his UFC debut, uh, taking that fight on short notice. Uh, Omar Morales uh, was the fighter that, that was uh, supposed to be fighting Rebecki. Originally, he did pull out. Uh, this was just a tough fight for Fiore, man. This, this guy, Rebecki, he's getting a lot of respect uh, from, from the masses. Uh, if you take a look at the betting line, obviously, there's a lot of respect coming his way. His performance on Dana White's Contender Series was just... Uh, so impressive, and people kind of understand what he's about. So uh, Fiore had had the uh, the grappling background and whatnot, but uh, Rebecca is just uh, Rebecca is just a whole different type of animal. Uh, getting getting some takedowns and whatnot, and um, I, I think there's a lot of uh, intriguing fights for Mateus Rebecca in the near future. And this is a fighter that I want to see start to to push up towards the top more rapidly because he's 30 years old already. I don't really think that you gotta slow play him that much I mean, he's currently ranked 63rd and i think that he could hang with a lot of guys in the top 50 easily uh even the top 40 top 30 so easily so um you know although he's ranked back more i'm going to be scrolling up here and um you know i'm looking i'm looking in the top 40 like i said i want to i want to get him on the quick path here um rafa garcia coming off a victory over mahasate mahasate uh, the, the Chinese fighter, who I still believe is a promising fighter as well, but that was a big time fight for Rafa Garcia. Uh, besides that, Rafa Garcia had the uh, the the loss, I believe, right here to to Jakar Close. He did drop that fight, but before that, had some good victories over Jesse Ronson, uh, Natan Levy, and uh, just how impressive he looked in that last fight. I think that I, I would really be interested to see how that fight plays out. Garcia is a very well-rounded fighter. Uh, he will make Rebecca work for those takedowns. I want to see some some striking exchanges between the two of them. That's a fight that I that I want to see. That that is the fight that I want to see. Um, so we're putting it. We're putting Rebecca on the fast track. If he gets a victory over Garcia, you start instantly throwing him up towards guys in the top thirty, top twenty. And uh, I think that's what the UFC will do. I'm expecting them to start to give him some names up there towards the top. And uh, I'm excited to see how he performs in those fights. All right, here. Now, now this fight here, man. Uh, Abdul Razak Al-Hassan versus Claudio Ribeiro. 
All right, this fight, it played out like a lot of us thought it would. We thought that these guys would, would, would really clash. I was a little surprised to see Abdul uh, Razak Al-Hassan kind of take a more cerebral approach. And I think that it, it paid off in a major way for him. The way that he was pushing Claudio up against the cage early and not just completely just going into a slugfest, um, which was kind of interesting, right? Because in the post-fight speech, he was giving uh, Buckley a hard time about Buckley mixing in some takedowns when he kind of kind of implemented a similar type style, which of course he eventually did get a brutal finish on the feet. It was beautiful to watch, um, but he kind of set set that up. And, uh, and then he was going after Buckley like crazy in the post uh, fight uh, press conference. If you guys didn't catch that, he wants a rematch. He didn't like the way that Buckley uh, was really wrestling him a lot through that fight and said he should have met in the middle and threw down. I'll tell you what, if he would have sat in the middle and threw down with Ribeiro from the very beginning, all the way through that first round, it might have not have been a good night for him because Ribeiro was having some success uh, early on, throwing some nice leg kicks. Uh, but again, props to Al Hassan because he set that that finish up beautifully, mixed things up, and it's great to see him rounding his game out. He's a fighter that I'm always intrigued to watch perform. And um, you know, real quick, also Claudio Ribeiro, big shout out to him. You know, I, I do my uh, my fight picks, my fight card picks, where I do a post on Instagram the morning of, and I tagged him in it. And he was kind enough to shoot me a message and say, thank you, I guess, for picking him. Obviously, you guys know I was on Ribeiro here. And then I even said, gave him a, a nice little uh, comment back and he even said something else nice back. But he's just a good dude. I mean, this guy's sitting there waiting to go to battle. He's probably just chilling on his phone, reaching out to fans and whatnot. I think he's a really good dude. I was really pulling for him here. Obviously, no official action, but uh, it was a little disappointing to see him get put out like that when he just seemed to be such a kind guy, you know, shoot me a message back and all that. And I really do believe that he will bounce back and, and come into the UFC. And I believe that he will, he will, he will get a, a devastating uh, winning uh, knockout in the UFC. I believe that he will knock out an opponent within the next year. I think that he has fight ending ability and with the right matchup, he'll put somebody out. All right. Definitely needs to work on some things, work on his takedown defense and, and, and creating space better and all that. Um, or, you know, just getting, getting, uh, his opponent off of him. He was getting held against the cage a little bit there. I would like to see him circle out better and work on his distance management and all that, but sharpen some things up. He's going to hurt people at range. So I hope that he does bounce back. And now for, uh, Abdul Razak Al Hassan, a fighter again, that is just always proven to be a fun fighter. There's just always a finish uh, around the way when he's fighting currently ranked 42nd in the middleweight division. And uh, we know, at least the teller believes that the uh, the middleweight division is kind of shallow. I mean, you get a couple big time victories and you have a name like Alassane just from being so uh, exciting to watch. Before you know it, you're, you're fighting in the top 15, top 20 very quickly here. So uh, with the type of uh, skill set that he has, um, you could easily see something like that happen. So yeah, I am going to actually be looking up towards the top of this division a little bit more so above him based on his fighting style based on the fact he's 37 years old and he has somewhat proven himself at this point in time uh, i want to give him a big fight and uh a fight that i that i'm eyeing uh, is edmund shabazi and i'm eyeing the edmund shabazi in fight edmund has had some issues with his wrestling and takedown defense and whatnot edmund's a fun striker as well i think that that fight would play out very very good um you can go a couple different routes with that. I know, I know some of you guys may think that that's a little bit of a jump as far as the ranking goes, but I think that there's no real reason why you can't make that fight happen. All right. Uh, I know we've also flirted with some other ideas for, for Edmund as well. But after the performance that Abdul just put on, I think that Edmund Shabazi and him makes a lot of sense. And that's a fight that I, that I wouldn't mind to see at all. Uh, you can go a couple different ways, but that was a fight that did stand out to me. All right. Javad Basharat takes out Mateus Mandanka. Uh, Mateus, you know, Using the, uh, the the finger sign like he was pointing a gun at Javid at the weigh-ins. And you got to love the fact that Javid gave it back to him at the end of that, that round there when he was getting up. And uh, Javid, I like this kid, Javid, man. Javid, a very well-rounded fighter. A, a very, very well-rounded fighter. That's what I like about him first and foremost. He's showing that he can do it all. He has grappling in his arsenal, good jiu-jitsu. His striking is so crisp. I love his footwork. Uh, he mixes things up beautifully. Javid is, is a true threat. I mean, you hear him talking about it on the telecast. It's legit. Uh, Javid is a fighter that we expect to, to really push his way towards the top. He's currently ranked 26th uh, in the bantamweight division. And um, you see him landed a nice shot here. 
Uh, and, and within this fight, I mean, we had it 30-27 on two judges' scorecards, and uh, one judge did give uh, Mateus a round. I believe that may have been the first round, correct? Right? I believe the first round, Mateus had a round that he did have some success in, uh, but, but slowed down uh, quite a bit. And was taken down there, ended the fight on bottom, and um, now we take a look at the Bantam rate, Bantam weight rankings, one of the most stacked divisions. There's ab absolutely no question. And now you throw Javid into the mix with, with these types of fighters. I mean, it's it's crazy. Um, you know, Javid, I have no problem with, with throwing him, uh, if putting him on the quick route as well. I mean, he's he's ready to go. He's re he's ready to go. Uh, I love how he handles himself. He's just a true professional. Um, Let's see here, man. I'm going to gloss over Montel Jackson and Jonathan Martinez. We're going to gloss over them here. Um, Jack Shore uh, coming off that loss against uh, Ricky Simone. Um, you know, I don't know if that's the fight that they're going to give. They don't typically match up fighters coming off a loss with the fighter coming off a win. Um, Chris Gutierrez uh, really took advantage of that match uh, matchup against Frankie Edgar, the legend that was uh, fighting way past his time. You know, obviously Frankie should have hung them up, but props to Chris Gutierrez for taking advantage of that fight. Now Chris Gutierrez gets to get locked in there with a young fighter that is on the up and up, and uh, that's the fight that I want to see. Two two beautiful strikers. I, I think that would be a, a very stylistic clash in the feet, and the fact that they both have um, very good, good, very good striking. It's almost like they're dancing out there, just the way that they move. It, it's almost like a, a ballerina s. And uh, I think you put Chris Gutierrez and Javid in there, and I would just love to see how the, how that how that works there on the, on the feet. I think it would be a striking matchup for the most part, and uh, that's the fight that I want to see. There's no question about that. That's a fight that that excites me. Lock up Chris Gutierrez and Javid Basharat, and if Javid gets a victory there, you're really going to see him start pushing towards the top. He's 27 years old. Kid's very very promising. All right. Now speaking of very promising, Umar Nurmagomedov knocks out Hayoni Barcelos with a weird. A step in left hook. It was, it was almost awkward, but you still got to give credit to Umar. Uh, I mean, he, he landed it. It was his shot. I mean, although it wasn't like a perfectly timed shot, uh, if you guys kind of understand what I'm saying, it was a little weird how he clipped him. Um, but it, it was, nevertheless, it was a beautiful K KO victory that put Hayoni out. Hayoni now, man, he's an aged fighter, especially for the division. And uh, not to take anything away from, from the performance and, and or to take anything away from Barcelos. He's just not the fighter that he once was. I, I really, really believe that. He obviously can't take a shot like he once could. Uh, his movement and rhythm in the octagon is definitely different than, than some of the fights that we've seen from him in the past. If you think about his fight with uh, Chris Gutierrez back in the day, I mean, that was a prime, prime Hione Barcelos. He's not the same fighter that went in there and took out Chris Gutierrez back in the day. Um, I mean, just to put things in perspective, uh, you know, Hione... Hayoni is now uh, 35 years old, about to be 36 in a couple of months. I mean, for the bantamweight division, it's just you know, you know. But but let's talk about Umar, man. Umar, 16 and 0. It is almost eerie how much of a vibe that he has. Uh, but but I know I know there's some differences, but the vibe uh, similar to how much of a vibe that he has similar to Khabib, his relative, and the fact of the dominance, the undefeated record, just his demeanor. Um, you know, you see pictures of him with, with the, the cap, the Dagestani cap. I mean, there's just so many similarities, the dominance, man, just, uh, I mean, these guys are just something different. Now, of course, Umar's doing it a little bit differently though. I mean, you didn't, you don't see Khabib going in there and, and you didn't see Khabib going there and really knock out guys like this. Khabib really relied on his grappling. So it's, that's, that's, what's intriguing and different about them. Uh, but the dominance is just something else. And I'll tell you what, uh, you know, Umar, Umar Nurmagomedov, his frame for this division is scary. Okay, it's the, the skill set's another thing, but then he has the perfect frame. And if you guys know, if you think about some of the more dominant fighters in their respected divisions, the fighters, of course, that, that were the most skilled, always obviously had a lot of success. But if you look at the, the top tier fighters, the greats, the real greats, the John Jones, the Conor McGregor when he was down in the featherweight division wreaking havoc, right? He had more, I mean, the weight cut was one thing, but still, when they have that frame, that giant frame for the division, it obviously really, really helps. Uh, Israel Adesanya, that crazy frame for the division. Umar, he's big, man. He's big for this division, and uh, that's uh, that's going to help him, uh, uh, you know, along with the the, the nasty skill set that he possesses. But uh, Umar Nurmagomedov, 27 years old. He's maybe not as young as you, you think, right? He's starting to uh, starting to. Uh, to creep into his prime. Still has some time to creep into his prime. But still, he's 27, just turned 27 years old. And uh, he is currently ranked the 11th 
top bantamweight in the world now. Uh, now, this is interesting, right? Do you want to give him a couple more setup fights or do you just start really throwing him to the fire? Because I obviously believe that he can fight with any of these guys at the top right now. I mean, he, he could potentially be fighting for the belt. Now, Umar did say that he plans on fighting for the belt in 2024, which, you know, for a fighter is to say that, he obviously is, doesn't want the championship fight that quickly because if he really did, he could actually just start shouting for for a championship match now, even if you don't get it right away. If you don't get it in your next fight, you know you're you're more inclined to just get it quicker than you would have if you start screaming for it now, right? You're going to get it quicker than you would if you say, "Oh, give me to next year." Then they may very well put you on ice to to next year. Now that might be his plan from the very get go, though. Maybe that's his plan. He wants more experience before he fights guys, uh, you know, like uh, Piotr Jan, uh, Sterling. Um, you know, Marab, you know, guys that have been doing this for uh, for a while now in the UFC, you know, a lot longer than him in the UFC. And um, if that's his plan, then then that's his plan. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of things you could do with him right now. Um, you know, Ricky, Ricky right now currently ranked ninth, coming off that big victory over Jack Shore that we just spoke about. Uh, has been doing his thing, going in there, taking out all these guys here. Um, you know, Dominic Cruz coming off the knockout loss. I, I don't want to really want to see that fight. I want to see a competitive fight here. Um, I think that the Ricky fight makes makes all the sense right now. Ricky's just been going out there steamrolling guys, looking amazing. I would love to see how the momentum of Ricky faces off against the momentum of Umar. Two guys that are just going forward with the full head of steam, clashing. Obviously, you guys know I do feel that Umar is going to prevail there because uh, this guy, I have Umar down as, as the future champion. I've said that before, but making sure that, that I get that out there again, and we'll make a video about that. We got to carve that in stone. Uh, Umar Nurmagomedov is going to control this bantamweight division for a long time. He's going to be the, the, the reigning uh, champion, uh, reigning UFC bantamweight champion for years to come. And he's going to go down as one of the greats. I just, I truly believe that he's just too well-rounded. He's too professional. He's too clean uh, with his overall skill set, And uh, it's going to be a problem for all these guys towards the top. Uh, sorry, there's going to be a guy owning that division. All right, now we're going to start talking some uh, some official action. And again, like I said, it was rough for me here. So bear with me here. Raquel Pennington defeats Ketlin Vieira. Uh, I did have Ketlin Vieira. I had a one-unit play on Ketlin Vieira. Uh, and real quick, too, you got to love that. We'll throw that out there real quick. You got to love that, that, that. Uh, newly added match uh, for UFC 286, Justin Gaethje versus Rafael Faziv. Excited for that one. Uh, but Raquel Pennington squeaks by with the split decision. We talked about the fact that this fight very well could have been a split decision. Um, I talked about earlier the fact that I kind of pushed some of these, I uh, forced some of these plays. I should have stayed away from this because you guys know I have a lot of respect for Rocky and we talked about how close this fight was going to play out. I just, I like the betting line. I mean, it was essentially a pick them, right? And I, I, I've liked what I've seen from Ketlin. I thought that she would have landed the, the more damaging blows in this fight and just uh, kind of squeaked a decision based on the fact she was landing the cleaner shots. I felt that she won the fight, but this fight could have very well won either way. And I think what, what sealed the fight for uh, Pennington was the fact that uh, at the end of the third round, when she had her back taken, she was the one that was active and throwing those punches from the beh from be uh, throwing behind, throwing those punches behind, and and landing some of those, and just looking like she wanted it more. And the judges rewarded her with the victory there, as Ketlin just held on and was throwing little soft knees. I I really believe that that moment uh, was what what changed this fight for the for the uh, for the judges. But if you could read the comment section, I mean, two to one for Vieira, but whatever robbery, holy robbery, uh, could have been a draw. Uh, uh, robbery, robbery, scored at 29, 28, uh, Vieira, uh, ain't no way Vieira lost, uh, damn judges are messed up. I mean, uh, who's the father of her baby, <laughs> uh, Rocky, someone getting a little personal there, but I mean, obviously the fight could have went either way and, and the majority of people did felt feel that Vieira won the fight. So, um, you know, that, that it is what it is. It was a one unit loss and I took that there. So, um, I mean, technically, Raquel Pennington gets the victory, so we got to talk about what's next for her, even though I was a little bit more excited to talk about what's next for Ketlin. Uh, Rocky is at, at the top of the, the mountain here. She's ranked fourth. Um, you got Irene Aldana there. You got Juliana Pena who's coming off the loss. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, I don't really know what they're planning on doing right now. You don't really see, obviously, you don't see any matches uh, locked up in the, to the top of this division. Um you know, Rocky obviously has already been defeated by Amanda Nunez. That was a nasty fight where Nunez just chewed her apart. I don't think that 
that Rocky has done enough to earn another title shot. And I think that she needs to get another big victory before we start talking about that. Um, this division's obviously a little bit shallow. So, so here we are. Give me Raquel Pennington and, and Juliana uh, Pena. I think that that's a fight that that we sh that would be fun. A fight that makes a lot of sense. The former champion versus, versus Rocky there. A fighter that just has a lot of respect. I think that makes all the sense in the world. Um, so what do you guys think about that? All right. Then we have Roman Kapilov taking out uh, Puna Seriano at a another small play, but uh, a losing play at that on Puna Lehi. Seriano. Um, I should have known better than to, than to take Seriano here. Um, yes, he's made me money, but he's also already bitten, bitten me before. His cardio is not the best. He, he loads up on his punches and he, he gasses himself out. The thing is, is that he, in his last fight, he, he really seemed to be throwing his punches more straight and seemed to be pacing himself a little bit more. He's still a young fighter. I thought that maybe he was cleaning that up. And Roman Kapilov is a fighter that slows down a little bit too. As we saw, he was slowing down at the end of the, at the end of this fight too. But uh, he's a fighter that eats a lot of shots. We've seen him bloodied up. Uh, I mean, against Albert Duryov, a, a grappling-based fighter, Duryov bloodied him up and jabbed him up on the feet, if you remember that fight over in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I felt that Seriano was going to be able to land some of those big shots, and he just wasn't. And it was just a, an extremely disappointing performance by Seriano because he was just wailing these overhands into to the arms and to the hands of Kapilov. It was just a bad look. He should have been mixing things up, going to the body, opening, opening the headshots up more, pacing himself, putting less shots. Uh, less uh, power into his shots and it just overall was a bad performance by him but i also want to give some praise to kapilov because kapilov definitely has been uh grooming himself out very nicely he's becoming a well-rounded fighter and for a fighter that had a little bit of a slow start to his career good for him he's starting to do his thing there he has a big frame for the division and i and i should have known better and that's on me and that's a loss on me so um i will make up for that all right so uh for for roman um, you know, Roman right now ranked 43rd on Tapology's uh, middleweight rankings. Uh, I mean, Roman's proven to be a pretty dangerous fighter here. Uh, I'm going to be jumping up through this division. Uh, let's see here. He's already fought uh, Albert Duryov. We see him right there. Um, you see Kyle Dawkins there. He's coming off a loss. You see Sariano. He just defeated him. And there he is, the man himself, Roman Kapila at 43. We're going to start continuing. We're going to continue to slide up. Um, we already matched up Eric Anders. Uh, we already have him matched up, so um, that that's not going to be somebody that we're going to look to match uh, up with. And and sorry, the name's slipping my mind now, but I do want to see that Eric Anders. Uh, uh, come on, from the Ultimate Fighter, uh, Andre Petrotsky. That that's the fight I want to see with Anders. So we're not going to do that fight there. Uh, we already matched up Ole Sechak with somebody. Um, you got Jacob Malkoon coming off that victory over Nick Maximov. I mean, that, that's a fight that I could easily see uh, being put together. Uh, you get the grappling of Malkoon, a fighter that's proven to be pretty durable and tough. Um, I think that that's a fight you could do. You know, Kapilov, to me, needs to, needs to show more before you start giving some really big-name fights. Throw him in there with uh, a fighter that doesn't really get a lot of respect because his, his style is not the most exciting. Jacob Malkoon, but he's good. And I uh, see how Kapilov does there. And uh, that, that's what we'll, we'll, we'll do there. All right, so Dan, Dan Ige goes out there, absolutely styles on Damon Jackson. No official play on this fight here. Uh, Dan Ige looked very, very good. Uh, was disappointed in, in Damon Jackson's performance overall. Uh, it was looking to strike with Ige, which I, th I felt that he should have been pushing the grappling and the wrestling a little bit earlier. Did not. And um, at the same time, it was good to see Ige get back into the win column. Um, Ige, although he's been having a tough time as of recently, putting things in perspective, he's been fighting some of the best fighters uh, in the division, right? I mean, losing to guys like uh, Mosar, uh, Josh Emmett, uh, Calvin Cater. I mean, these are top guys. So, um, you know, it's good to see him get back in the win column. And I think that there's some some big time matchups in the near future for Ige after a performance like that. So he's currently ranked uh, 13th in the division. And um, you take a look at some of the fighters that are around him right now. Uh, super uh, Sadiq Yusuf is always a fun fighter to watch. Uh, that's a that's a name that that does ring out to me a little bit. Uh, Sadiq Yusuf and, and Dan Ige. I think that would actually be a, a great fight. I think that would be a very good fight. Uh, you see them ranked 13 and 14th right next to each other. Uh, not just because they're right next to each other. That, I mean, that's the fight that makes sense to me. I think that Ige needs to string off a, uh, more than just one victory before we start talking about some of the bigger names. Even though we've talked about him fighting some of these big names he's lost. I want to see him get some more momentum. Uh, and, and if he's able to go out there and take out uh, Sadiq Yusuf, that, that's a fighter that that does 
gain a lot of respect if you're able to go out there and take him out. And same for, for Yusuf. If Yusuf can go out there and get a victory over Ige, that would be really big for him. That's the fight to make. I, I really think that that's the fight to make. Um, so that, that's where I'm going there. All right, guys. We're going to be uh, hitting up the main event, which you guys know I had one more loss on this card, man. 0 for 3. Again, I promise you guys we're going to be bouncing back very strong. That's what I do, and that's what I will do. All right, so Sean Strickland defeats uh, Nazaruddin Amavov. You guys know I picked uh, Amavov. Obviously, th this fight had its own video because the fight was made uh, after I did my, my full card breakdown. Listen, I, I stand behind the play. Um, Nazaruddin Amavov, first off, I, I respect his skill set. He's very well-rounded. I've liked what I've seen from him period going into this fight i've liked what i've seen uh i did have a little bit of a question mark about his cardio but you know checking him out on instagram he's going into a five round fight initially matched up with kelvin gastelum i just i felt confident that he would have been coming into this fight in the best condition and best shape of his life which i do believe was the case i do believe this was the best we've seen him obviously right i mean going into the fifth round throwing down with a guy like sean i mean and some of his other fights we've seen him gas out way earlier um or gas out in some of his other fights and he didn't gas out in this fight sean strickland is just an absolute animal uh, comes in at 205 looking pudgy um you know really haven't he hadn't even been in the gym for about a week they said around the time you know going into this fight he was planning a, a snowboarding trip he's riding his motorcycle all over the place i mean i i just amavov looks so much bigger at the weigh-ins and um I thought that Amavov was going to squeak off a decision here. I thought that he would have success with that left hook, which he was throwing early. We saw Pajeda drop Strickland. Uh, Strickland, he's just funky. He keeps his hands down at times. Sometimes he gets hit with some big shots. We saw him get hit uh, with, with a spinning heel kick from Dos Santos back in the day. Zaleski Dos Santos. Pajeda clipped him. But overall, he has had a lot of fights in UFC, so he has proven that, that he sees those shots coming. And, and that's what he did here. He saw those shots coming, was avoiding them, just slipping out of the way making Amavov land a lot of hand shots, glove shots, and he was just countering him beautifully, jabbing him up, bloodying him up. And big shout out to Sean Strickland. I think that his stock went up in a huge way. He got a nice paycheck and his stock went up in a huge way, completely erases that close fight with uh, J Jared Cannonier. He was able to get on the mic and again, all week explain how that that was a robbery, which I don't think it was a robbery. I did think Strickland won that fight. It was a close fight, but now he starts pushing that narrative where everyone just pretty much is going to flow with that. So it's like he won that fight. And you're talking about some big fights now for, for Sean Strickland uh, coming up in the near future. He, he's right right in the mix right away, again, for, for fighting with, for the title and all that. I'm telling you. Uh, not fighting for the title right now, but he's right there. You know, a couple more, a couple, another big win, and maybe he's right there. So right now, Pajeda's the champion. He's going to be rematching out of Sanya. We know that's to come. Robert Whitaker is an absolute animal. Cannoneer had the victory, but we talked about that already, and Cannoneer's up there in age. I almost feel like Strickland already is going to be surpassing uh, Cannoneer as far as for being next for that that next big fight, that next title eliminator fight. I don't know. Uh, that's just a vibe that I'm getting. Um, I would love to see Robert Whitaker take on Sean Strickland. That's the fight that that's to be made, right? I mean, that, that's all that's there anyway. Um, Sean Strickland versus Robert Whitaker. Uh, Robert Whitaker is without a doubt one of the uh, one of the greatest middleweights to ever do it. First and foremost, a former middleweight champion. But he, and even though even though now he's not the champion, as far as a fighter not being a champion in the respected division, I would say that Robert Whitaker is about as talented and as good as it gets. As far as just being one step under the current champ or whatnot, right? I mean, Robert Whitaker arguably beat Izzy in, in that the, the uh, second fight, which was very close. I think Izzy, Izzy took that fight, but it was close. But Robert Whitaker is just really, really talented. And Sean Strickland gets a victory over him. We're talking about uh, we're talking about a, a, an instant title shot uh, on the horizon. And you already know that Jared Cannonier lost to Whitaker back in 2020. So, I mean, that's why I, all signs are pointing to Strickland and Whitaker, in my opinion, and that being a title eliminator fight. It should be. I think it should be. So that, that's exactly how the middleweight should be playing out right now. Izzy versus Pajeda. Throw that rematch together. You do Strickland versus Whitaker. Uh, and the that's a title eliminator fight. And Kenanier, even though he had he squeaked that victory, he's going to be on the back burner waiting for, for a fight. So uh, that, that's how I see it going down. Major shout out to Sean Strickland for stepping it up. All right, guys. So that's a wrap of UFC Vegas 67. Thank you guys for tuning in. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Catch me on all my social media platforms on Instagram at MMA Fortune Teller underscore on Twitter at the MMA Teller. I got all types of content coming your way. I appreciate you guys all so much. You guys can expect uh, another video coming up here very soon coming up on the channel. Obviously, we have a, a, a 
a big event taking place this upcoming Saturday with the light heavyweight championship of the world on the line. Jamal Hill versus Glover Teixeira. Uh, the Brazilians are ready to go this upcoming weekend. I can't wait to get that video out to you guys. I'll be working on that here very soon. All right, guys. You guys all have uh, a very blessed Martin Luther King Day. I'm filming this Monday. And uh, you take care. All right, guys. Signing out. Tell it. Welcome to the show. This is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.